Welcome back. Um, for the next session, B2B marketing shouldn't just mean talking to the leads you already know. This session talks to the practicalities of engaging buyers at every different stage of the purchase cycle. And who better to help do, us, who, who better to help do that for us than Jason Miller, author of Amazon's number one bestseller, Welcome to the Funnel, and leader of global content marketing at LinkedIn. And Jason is joined by Doug Kessler, creative director and co-founder of Velocity Partners, who started his career at Ogilvy & Mather and then jumped ship to specialize in B2B. He's a self-described content junkie, a copywriter at heart, with a secret passion for analytics. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that warm intro. Uh, so uh, Jason Miller, I'm from San Francisco. Um, very excited to be here. I, uh, usually I, talk, I think about uh, content marketing a little bit differently. So I have a background in, in B2C, but I'm a B2B marketer. I love rock and roll. I love heavy metal. <clears throat> my spare time, I shoot concert photography, so you'll see some of my own photography inside this presentation. But uh, I want to make you think about content a little bit differently. Uh, people complicate these things all the time. It's already a complicated enough marketing world out there, uh, and I like to break it down and sum it up uh, very quickly. So um, this is called Welcome to the Funnel. It is from my book. There are copies all over the place, so please grab one. Um, it's everything I know about social and content rolled into one with a little bit of uh, kind of fun and flair. So <clears throat> the hashtag, this one goes to 11. I'm competing with Adweek's hashtag, unfortunately, I forgot about that. Anyway, so let's get started. I'm going to take you back to 1978. This is Mr. John Travolta. This is from Saturday Night Fever. This is the biggest selling soundtrack in the history of the world. Disco was a phenomenon. Disco was everywhere. Disco, you could not get away from it, right? But there was this little movement called punk rock, London Calling. This was recorded, one of the greatest records in, in the history of the world, recorded right down the street from here. There was this little movement called punk rock. And they needed some press, they needed some people, they needed some noise, they needed some people to know about them, right? But all the critics were covering was disco. It was disco this, disco this. It's a global phenomenon. So what'd they do? Well, these bands like the Pistols, the, uh, the Clash, the Ramones, they started to tell their own story. And they became so outlandish that they forced people to pay attention, right? And this is where we're at. And they took over the world. They became the next phenomenon. They made the press pay attention. They became their own media. And I love this next quote, this is from Mr. Jello Biafra, who is the singer of the, thank you, the Dead Kennedy, San Francisco punk rock band, and he famously says, not so really famously, but he says, don't hate the media, become the media, right? That's where we're at today. That's what content marketing enables us to do. Tell our own story. Why would you not want to tell your own story? But take it a step further. Own the conversation. Ask yourself, what conversation out there do you want to own? You no longer need to rely on big media to do this. You can tell your own story. You can amplify it. Native advertising. And you can be successful. And you can differentiate yourself, right? Add a layer of thought leadership to that, and you're at a whole new level. So that brings me to, <laughs> I'm a purist here, right? The world does not need more content. We need more relevant content. Google and the search engines have killed off the content farms. Why is that? Because they were, they, were, they were clogging up the search results with crap keyword stuffed content that was not helpful. All, all that is done. So you no longer have to write 17 blog posts today to make an impact. You can start writing this morning and make an impact two hours later. You can make a much bigger impact if you stick with it, but you have to stick with it, right? And, but the number one, this is no longer a numbers game. It's a game of relevance. And this is uh, from a, a research report that came out a couple of years ago. I call it Rage Against Irrelevance, but 44% of overall respondents say they would consider ending a brand relationship because of irrelevant promotions. 44%. That is a big number. And take it a step further, an additional 22% say they would definitely defect from a brand. If you are promoting content that is irrelevant to your audience, they will leave you. And they will go to the next best author or the next best content source. You don't want to be losing anyone in this day and age. It's already too noisy. So you ask yourself, what conversation do I want to own? How do I own it? And then you write the biggest piece of content of your life, right? So I call that the big rock. As Doug Kessler over here famously says, one home run per quarter, right? This, the big rock is a substantial stake in the ground piece of content. You ask yourself again, what conversation do I want to own and how do I own this? It's moving from thinking like a publisher to actually publishing like a publisher. If you want to own the conversation, you write the definitive piece of content on it, right? But then, what do you do with this enormous piece of content, right? Well, this comes from, I need a better analogy for the global market, I know. But Rebecca Lieb at the Altimeter Group, one of the smartest content marketers on the planet, I asked her years ago, when I was figuring this stuff out, 
I said, Rebecca, what do you tell these companies to say I don't have enough content to power demand gen and lead generation uh, and social? Like, and, and she says, look at the content that you have laying around and think of it like leftover turkey. And Thanksgiving, I know, bear with me, you, uh, we have this big beautiful bird and then what are you doing for the next 30 days? Well, you're slicing and dicing this thing into turkey sandwiches, turkey pot pie. You're making things with turkey, you probably should be make, making with turkey, but you're being efficient, right? So you can think about your content, this big rock, the same way. This enormous piece of content, right? And I'll show you a specific example with the actual numbers that I hope will blow your mind. But one piece of content can be repurposed into blogs, slideshow presentations, videos, webinars, et cetera, et cetera. It's about how much you can get out of this, how much can you scale one piece of content, more with less. Bigger impact, right? Have you strangled this piece of content and got every ounce of value out of it? Has every audience seen this? Because there is always a new audience waiting to discover that content. I went to see Motley Crue 30 days in Las Vegas last week, and they sold it out. Why'd they do that? Because there's a new audience waiting to discover Motley Crue, even though I loved them in 1984. Bad analogy again. I'm getting better with those. So <laughs> this is how I think about content on LinkedIn. Doug is going to show you some examples of how his agency works with uh, partners, or his agency works with his brands to develop it. But this is a, this is inside look at how we create content at LinkedIn, <laughs> LinkedIn Marketing Solutions specifically. So we take the big rock, we slice and dice that thing to fuel our content hubs on LinkedIn. There are four content hubs: SlideShare, LinkedIn Groups, sponsored updates, company pages, and we're expanding. Right. When I got to LinkedIn, the biggest question, the conversation I wanted to own was, how do I market effectively on LinkedIn? You type that into a search engine. We weren't on page one. This is years ago. I wanted to get that back. Who was there? Who was on page one? Social Media Examiner, Social Media Explorer, Social Media Today. They were telling our story for us. They were reaping the benefits of our traffic. But they were telling an outdated story because we're the experts and we need to, we need to be the authority on this topic, right? So what did I do? <laughs> I wrote the book on it. The Sophisticated Marketer's Guide to LinkedIn. It's everything you'd want to know about marketing on LinkedIn, but it's written strategically instead of instructionally because what happens when you get an instruction manual? You throw it in the trash and you go to YouTube. I knew I should have chewed gum for this presentation. I apologize. But so the big rock piece of content. Then what happens next, right? This is 65 pages. This is a beast of a piece of content. This guy comes up to me at Content Marketing and says, I love the sophisticated guy, but there's too much value there. I said, are you out of your damn mind? What marketer has ever downloaded a piece of content and said there's too much value here? I'd like to give this back. No marketer but let's see if we can all do that. So, but he had a short-sighted view of what I was going to do with this piece of content. We would repurpose this thing into infographics, slide shares, the physical book, the mobile version, influencer blogs, lifted. We got 56 pieces of content out of one big rock piece of content. But better yet, we didn't create anything new. We basically lifted these, all these pieces exist in the guide. We just lifted them out as snackable pieces. <clears throat> because if you're not ready, to consume this enormous piece of content and give us your lead gen information, then we're gonna get you, we're gonna follow you around, we're, gonna, we're going to use our own product, right? So, not, <laughs> this is so funny, not only are we creating a useful piece of content, as Jay Bear says, famously says, sell something, get a customer for a day, help someone get a customer for life, we are helping people at the top of the funnel. We're answering the number one question, how do I market successfully on LinkedIn? But we're also going to use LinkedIn Marketing Solutions as a case study. We're going to prove, I'm going to prove, that LinkedIn Marketing Solutions works, that the channels, the tools, they work with the right piece of content. It's relevance, right? This is what happens. Oh, I forgot. One of the most difficult things I've ever done in my entire life is take a piece of content, take, take a piece of content global. This is the Portuguese version. I don't even know what the hell this says. I don't even know if this is right, but I trust my leads, right? But it's the same damn piece of content. We launched this thing over a year ago and it's still our number one driver. It's our number two driver. I'll show you the number, number one driver in a second. Oh. And where does all this live at? Where does the big rock live at? Where do the turkey slices live at, right? And we actually say this at LinkedIn. People call it turkey slices and big rock content. But I call it the blog. The blog is not the sexiest piece of social media, but it's certainly the most important. It's your mothership. It's the blog. The blog is a social media rug that ties the room together. The dude abides, right? But don't, com don't confuse the blog with a resource center. A resource center is an index library of your content, right? It's necessary. It's searchable. It's great. But a blog is a running narrative. It's where you tell your story. It's got comments. It's got dates on it. It's living. It's breathing, right? And you own this. And it's flowing in one direction. One direction. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, <laughs> so you got the big rock. And you're going to chop it up.
But that's, you also need this always on strategy, right? So the day to day kind of content. So I call this the blogging food groups. I borrowed this from uh, Rick Burns at HubSpot. It's not mine, but I took my own spin on it. So what we do here at LinkedIn, and I suggest every marketer does this because you have to differentiate the content on your blog. If you don't, it's like, it's like eating the same lunch every single day. You're going to get bored with it, right? So how can you mix up the content on your blog and stay interesting? Well, I'll give you some examples. Not following this exactly, but we start off on Monday with some Raisin Bran content, right? <clears throat> we call it Raisin Bran because it's easy to dish out. It's how to tips for this, how to, how to do this, five tips for this, et cetera, et cetera. You don't know where your audience is coming from. They might have had a rough weekend. They might have a hangover. You want to ease them into the week with some good, easy content. Then you get into Tuesday. We call that the spinach post. The spinach post, a little bit more difficult to chew, but it's good for you, right? A little bit more thought leadership. Maybe even some research. Then that leads into Wednesday. Wednesday is what we call the roast post. This is a substantial 1,500 word blog post, maybe 2,000, lots of link backs for SEO. But if you wanna own a conversation very quickly, especially a long tail keyword conversation, the roast is going to get you there, right? And then Thursday, we call Thursday Tabasco. It's where you take a very strong opposing view on something. Take a stand on something, call somebody out, start a little fire, put a little fire on the tongue, right? Because then you're gonna go <clears throat> straight into Friday, which is my favorite day of the week. We call it chocolate cake content. Now, chocolate cake content, you just put your audience through this great, immense amount of content, right? And you want to send them into the weekend with a smile on their face so they'll come back and do the whole thing again on Monday. So, I don't have, I didn't want to bring examples of every piece of content, so I brought two pieces of chocolate cake for you. Number one, I wrote this on my personal blog. It's the most successful blog post I've ever written in my life. I know it's unfortunate, but it's called 10 Hysterically Funny Reviews of Led Zeppelin 4 by 10 People Who Hate It. This is curated content. Led Zeppelin 4 is arguably the greatest recording of all time. I know I've said that three times, but this is in my opinion. Uh, but on Amazon, there were a number of people who hate this album. I thought, how is this possible? It has 5,000 five-star reviews, but there were hundreds of one-star reviews. So I pulled my favorites, and I'll share one with you. By a customer, this is a real review. Yes, I know some people gave this album five stars, but I've seen some five-star reviews for the movie Howard the Duck here. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, easy to curate this stuff, it's fun. Uh, I got one more for you, this. <laughs> I was coming back from Las Vegas to see Guns N' Roses, right? I was coming back into the office when I worked at Marketo. And if I had to rank events in my life, it would be uh, wedding day, birth of my child, Guns N' Roses in Las Vegas. <laughs> and I get back to the office and John Miller, no relation, he'll be the first one to tell you that, not me. I go into his office and John, I got a great, piece of, uh, a great idea for a chocolate cake piece of content. He says, what is it? I said, five content marketing lessons from Guns N' Roses. And he goes, I don't hate it, which means full steam ahead. <laughs> so <laughs> I wrote the post. But what would happen next would completely blow my mind. I hope you were all strapped in. Guns N' Roses shared my Marketo blog post. That means that Axl Rose may or may not be consuming my content. <laughs> this is not Photoshop, folks. This really happened. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what the hell? is Axel Rose gonna do, or Guns N' Roses do for the market automation space? <laughs> Nothing, I'm not gonna lie to you. But what it did for our audience on the blog is it injected some personality, it differentiated us, right? It's, it showed that we like to have fun, that B2B marketing can be sexy again, it can be fun. And they came back, they left with a smile, and they came back Monday, and they went through all the whole process again. That's what you want them to do. Relationship building, <laughs> entertaining them on occasion, but also helping them. So, <coughs> excuse me. What does success look like? This is, this is my, basic, uh, my basic demand gen model here. So you have the turkey slices ungated at the top, going to the big rock piece of content, and then your basic nurture flow, right? Don't overcomplicate this stuff, people. I've seen demand gen waterfalls that look more complicated than nuclear reactor plans, right? We're getting out of control with this. Simplify it. I call this the bat out of hell strategy. Oh. <laughs> Put your seatbelt on for this, right? For those about to launch, fire. This is everything we used to promote this big rock piece of content. The Sophisticated Marketer's Guide to LinkedIn. Email, blog, in-mail, company pages, sponsors updates, slide share, display, PPC, Twitter. There are only two channels here that are not LinkedIn marketing solutions, right? So what are the results? First 30 days. This is interesting. It went global in the first 30 days. Now, if you look at the first chart there, those are MQLs. If this is what's really interesting about this. With this always on turkey slice approach of the big rock, you're going to get a number of different solutions here that are driving MQLs, right? So the purple there, 
Email. Of course, email is going to come out swinging because it's the big blast, right? Second, though, in second place, you see the blog. And if you look at this 60 days, 30 days out, or 60 days out, I'm sorry, the blog takes over because we have the turkey slices with this rolling thunder approach, like rolling on. It's continually driving traffic. If you look at it 90 days out, that's where it gets beautiful, then sponsored updates. Native advertising takes over. Why is that? Because it's always on, because you're paying to promote your own good content. This is where we're at. It's 2015. If you, don't have, like, if you don't have budget for social and content now, you're behind. You're missing out. I promise you that. It doesn't take a huge investment, but it takes an investment. So <laughs> this, anyone know who this is? This is from a presentation I do called uh, How to Achieve Face Melting Content Marketing ROI. This is Mr. Ingve Malmsteen. He's a Swedish neoclassical guitar expert. He melts faces with his guitar. <laughs> Mr. Eddie Van Halen. He's also known to melt a few faces with his guitar. And finally, the almighty Mr. Jimi Hendrix. But in the history of the world, there has only been one face actually melted, and that's at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> no good? You guys are killing me up there. So, one piece of content, 18,000% ROI. I will tell you the exact numbers later, but one piece of content <laughs> drove $4.6 million in business in one quarter. Why? Because we cut through the crap. We got to pure relevance. We answered the number one question and we owned the conversation. We answered the question better than any of our competitors and now we built authority. One piece of content, the, the big rock, the turkey slices, always on. I love it. So, this leads into my finale. <clears throat> I call this the death of the one-dimensional marketer. At, when I was at Marketo, I learned very quickly that you can no longer be an expert in one thing. You have to have uh, multiple disciplines, right? So, the perfect marketer doesn't have to be an expert in SEO, but he has to understand how it affects demand gen and content and social. He doesn't have to be an expert in demand gen, but he has to understand how content fuels demand gen. Right? He has to understand the market automation space. He has to, but you also have to understand PR. So the death of the one-dimensional marketer is, is, is this idea I have of this new hybrid marketer, which I hope all, we, all of us in this room are this hybrid marketer, right? where we're all making changes based on a little bit of everything. We understand the entire process, not just one part of it. Right? So <clears throat> this is the marketing team of the future, as demonstrated by KISS, my all-time favorite band. Again, idea came to me on a plane, coming back from Vegas, seeing Kiss. These are my photos, by the way, you're about to see. Uh, so again, uh, best days of my life, wedding day, baby. Baby just new. It's new. I, sometimes I forget it. Uh, Guns N' Roses in Vegas, and then Kiss in Vegas. That's in this moment, right here. <laughs> so let's just jump right in. All right, so what you have here. It's you have the four members of Kiss demonstrated by each arm of your marketing team. What you have here, you have Mr. Peter Chris as the SEO, he's the beat, he's laying the rhythm of the band, right? Just like your SEO guy optimizes for content. He knows the conversations you're looking for based on keyword research, then he optimizes your content, optimizes your bids, et cetera, et cetera, right? He works along with, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, Paul Stanley on social, Gene Simmons, of course. Let me show you how this works, animated. <laughs> so, your marketing team needs to have four unique band members working together to deliver an amazing experience, amazing product, amazing service, right? So you start off, Mr. Peter Chris, or whoever may be playing Peter Chris, Laying the groundwork, he goes into Mr. Paul Stanley, the voice and the tone, he's a social, he's a star child, he's out there in the beginning, right? He's setting the stage. And then he goes into <laughs> Mr. Gene Simmons, the core of the band, the content guy. He writes all the songs, he sings the ones that Paul can't sing because Paul's voice is too high. But furthermore, he fuels demands in. Mr. Ace Freely here, tying it all together. So. Content fueling demand gen, social telling content, I need more of this, we're A-B testing it, but demand gen is saying, this is working more, Gene, we need more of this type of, type of content. And what happens? They produce, they produce content in the big rock form that their fans and consumers want to share. Now, I know what you're thinking. Killers sucks. That was a terrible record. Why is it up here? I don't know. Lick it up makes up for it, right? Anyway, my, my point is they're delivering their big rock pieces of content, and they're working together seamlessly and it's optimized, and they can't fail except for the killer's record. But I think they lost the original member during that. <laughs> Even more importantly, Doc McGee 
their PR guy, their manager, he tours with them. Is your PR team aligned with your content marketing social team? Because they have the same damn message and many times they're talking to the same damn people. The analysts are crossing over into influencers. The influencers are crossing over into press. It's all coming together. The bigger the company, the bigger the silos. Break these walls down. Put the band together. Get them on stage. Then, event marketing. Kiss takes these bands on tour. Doc McGee goes on tour with them. Doc McGee also discovered Skid Row and Motley Crue, by the way. A little fun fact. No good? All right. <laughs> most importantly, most importantly, they built a thriving community. I'm a card-carrying member of the Kiss Army. I advocate for these guys. Gene and Paul have figured out how to get this entire army of people to advocate for them, to share their content, to talk about them, right? They make them feel like they are part of something bigger than what they are. Is your community... Is your, is your target audience, have you brought them in? Have you embraced them? Have you made them feel as if they are bigger than something as a whole? Do they have other marketers who have the same feelings that they can commit to and hang out with? That's the KISS Army. Smartest content marketers on the planet. Oh, that's the book. There are plenty of copies out here. This is our second big rock piece of content, our number one MQL driver right now. I wanted to own the conversation on thought leadership and LinkedIn. We wrote the damn book on it. We're doing the same exact thing. This scales out. You choose the next conversation you want to own, and then you write the damn book on it, or you create the video on it. You create your masterpiece, and then you slice and dice it. It will fuel your content, your social, your demand gen channels for up to a year. I promise you that. And then you own this, and you can revise it whenever you feel like it. It's great. So I will leave you with this. Paul, he was right there. He spit the guitar pick, and I dove for it, and this girl kicked me in the head, and I missed it. But I got this picture. Anyway, we seem, we seem to forget this as B2B marketers a lot, right? Uh, people want a thrill. People want a spectacle. And people love to be entertained. That's Kiss's motto. That's how they got so big. That's why they're the greatest marketers on the planet and the greatest content marketers I know. Uh, so thank you so much. I will pass it along to Mr. Doug Kessler. Thank you. Whoa. Note to self, never share a stage with... Jason Miller. <laughs> That's a cult of one. <laughs> I'm an American too. I'm the different kind. I'm the introverted kind. So <laughs> none of the bands I listen to paint their faces. Uh, <laughs> Gillian Welch is my idea of a good time. But I love following Jason online and in person because of this evangelizing for how B2B can kick B2C's ass sometimes. And that's what I love about it. I mean, right now is a golden age of B2B, but people are still aiming too low. I think people are, they're thinking, look, I make supply chain management software. That fun stuff is for Nike. I do lift trucks, you know? And that, I think, is just a huge mistake. And so when Jason asked me to come along and just share some of the pieces, some of them are big rocks, some of the things that point to our big rocks that we've done for clients that are aiming a little bit higher. And to start it off, I just wanted to share something we didn't produce. I wish we had. One of my favorite B2B pieces lately. A lot of you have probably seen it. So truck manufacturer, selling to truck buyers. You know, what do you do? You, you've got 150 features in any truck. You shove them down people's noses every time you see them, right? Every chance you get, you just give them your features. Well, this team, really, really confident team, says we're just going to take one little feature from this truck, one feature, and we're going to design the ultimate demo. And we're going to get the biggest star that Belgium has ever produced <laughs> to demonstrate it. So let's show the video. I've had my ups and downs, my fair share of bumpy roads and heavy winds. That's what made me what I am today. Now I stand here before you. What you see is a body crafted to perfection. A pair of legs engineered to defy the laws of physics. And a mindset to master the most epic of splits.
fucking be? <laughs> I mean, that's just a thing of beauty. Oops, I went for it. I'll wait. I'll, I'll go back again. What I love about it, I've seen that maybe 15 times now, and every time I just think it's not just a super confident thing to do, but it's beautifully made. I mean, the music, the camera work, the script, the sunset, they got, or the sunrise, they got it that moment at the sunrise, so they had to, you know, get it in their first take, basically. I guess you don't want to have to do more than one take of that. It's just an amazing piece of work. And for me, that's a huge, huge home run because they aimed to hit a home run. You know, they went for it. And for me, home runs is what it's all about. So if you look at this scientific chart, goodies over time, goodies is anything that you care to measure that's good for you and times time. Two curves. The lower one is a normal content marketing program. Each time you publish a piece of content, spikes up a little bit, settles down. New piece spikes up, settles down. Most content marketing programs look like that one. The upper one is when you start adding home runs to the mix, these wonderful pieces. And what happens is it spikes with each home run piece, it spikes a lot higher and it's dramatically higher. But also when it settles back down, it doesn't settle right back down to the level that it started at. It settles at a significantly higher level. And your next piece does it again and your next piece does it again. And what you're doing there is essentially creating a great content brand, right? You're creating a brand that says if they publish this, I'm going to read it. If they produce this, I'm going to watch it. So Volvo's next truck demo, I'm in the queue to watch. And I would never have said that before that piece. And that to me is the goal of a content marketing program. And it takes home runs. So what makes a home run? How do you do it? An old creative director of mine said, B2B decision making is rational, build a case. Be a lawyer. And I liked that actually. At the time it really attracted me. I was coming from the consumer side. I didn't like this feeling of be a good mother, use this fabric softener. It felt icky, you know, to try to manipulate people that way. So I like the idea of I'm going to build a case. I'm just going to convince people to do stuff. But over the course of my career, I've kind of realized that it isn't just that. You can't just convince someone to do something. The formula I like to think about is head times heart equals hit or home run. And the key part here, so the head is just, yeah, convince them, make a case, you know, do a rational sell. But the heart is make them feel something. Don't just make them think something make people feel something, which to me came way too late in my career in B2B to realize that that's still part of our job. And the key to the formula is the multiplication sign, because if either of the values are zero, the total is zero too. You could have an unbelievably great story, but if you bury it in a boring old white paper, it's dead. Or you can have a really sexy thing, and if it's empty, there's no idea there, there's no there there, it's dead too. It's not going to make any impact after the attention. So if you can get them both, you've got yourself a hit. And that's what we try to start exploring with our clients. Um, one of my favorite TED Talks, Simon Sinek, talks about people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. They buy the beliefs of the company. And when I heard him say that, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe for Apple, I don't know. But I started to look at my favorite brands and my favorite content and realized how many of them really are doing this, consciously exposing their beliefs finding out why they do what they do, and getting it out front instead of hiding it. Uh, we did a project with Sprint Business, mobile operator in America, and it was to start, position the company, the division or the, the business division, and you know, do the content for it and do the messaging and things like that. So we start asking these kind of questions. Why do you do what you do? Why, why, why? Is it just technology for technology's sake? And a lot of people market to B2B decision makers as if they're just decision making units. And the people who work for them are production machines, you know. But when you talk to most people in most businesses, they don't think of their people that way. They think of them as people. And they actually want them empowered and happy and firing on all cylinders and engaged, not just maximally productive, which is what most technology talks to companies about. Make your people more productive. And one of the guys in Sprint said, people don't exist for businesses. Businesses exist for people. And we grabbed that as a heart of the positioning for Sprint business. And so this is what it really is about. Um, so the home page is the strap lines for companies with people in them. I had somebody pull me aside and said, 
don't all companies have people in them? <laughs> I think they missed the point. Okay, what do you come to work for? Most people don't just do it for the money, and we sure don't do it for the glory, we do it for each other. And it starts to drill down into what gives us meaning at work. Or, a, you know, this is the typical, this is the competition. Work more collaboratively with integrated communications, lowercase i, uppercase c, not sure why. Get reliable phone service, fast internet, cloud-based Google apps and one easy to, that's just typical telco talk. There's nothing particularly bad about it. That's the background. But the equivalent page on the Sprint Business site, the solution page, is empower your weirdos. Somehow you assemble a motley crew of completely amazing people. Let's help them do their jobs better, enjoy their work more, and stay on top of everything that matters. That's what Sprint Business Solutions are all about. Dig in. So just starting to say, all right, why are we doing what we're doing? And then we produced a video that's trying to capture that too because we talked to some of their customers. And the way they talk about their people is very different than the way that most people assume IT buyers make their decisions. So let's run this video. People say I'm the boss around here. And all these people, some say they work for me. They don't. These people carry the whole business on their shoulders. No matter where they are, helping customers, using new solutions, finding better ways to work together. They show up. They kick the ball forward with talent and energy and enthusiasm. These people, they don't work for me. I work for them. Again, just celebrating their beliefs instead of pushing any product at all. What happens if you just say, there's something that motivates us, let's capture that and celebrate that. Which is, I think, a really good guide to content. If you're sitting around thinking, what's our new content? What do we believe and how can we celebrate that? Putting aside what we need to sell people after that. And what happens? Anne Hanley says, practice pathological empathy. I really like that. The idea of insisting on getting inside the head of your target audience into, again, what they're feeling, not just what they're thinking, so that you can tap into that. Um, with Salesforce.com, one of their beliefs, big, big belief is sales and marketing ought to work together better. And yet, it's not a very common phenomenon. It doesn't happen that much. And we started talking to salespeople, started talking to marketers, figure out why. And this weird thing came out, really, they don't do it more because it's awkward, you know? They don't really talk the same language. It's a little bit embarrassing when they get together. They are almost like singing to different songs or something. And so that social embarrassment is an actual real obstacle to the business success that comes when you align sales and marketing. And so we tried to, again, all right, let's take that feeling and see if we can get people over it, essentially tease them for feeling that way, and urge them to get over that. So if we could show this one as well. Oops, sorry, I gotta get you there first. Yep. Here's a weird thing. Your sales guys are great at selling, and your marketing guys are fantastic at marketing. But your pipeline, not so great. For some reason, your sales and marketing people aren't working together. They're not on the same hymn sheet. There are completely different barbecues. One day you read a blog post and discover what's missing. It's called sales and marketing alignment. You need some of that. Oh, sorry. But you're worried it sounds kind of embarrassing. You don't want to overdo this alignment thing. Your sales and marketing guys won't have to pretend to be best friends. They won't have dress-alike Tuesdays. He gets it. Or lunchtime sing-alongs. Kumbaya. They won't have to double date. Mm. So creamy. Or use emojis in every text. They don't have to commute together. Man. What? Monday. We'll go all gushy on conference calls. Oh, you hang up. Okay, all right, bye. That's not sales and marketing alignment. That's just stupid. Sales and marketing alignment is just a few common sense things. Get together once in a while, maybe with biscuits. Agree on what an ideal prospect looks like. Nice. Define when a lead is really sales ready. You like? I love. Link your marketing automation to your CRM and track the stuff that matters. That's it. Sales and marketing alignment. Break out the biscuits. So again, instead of just trying to cram down the benefits of working better together, 
we try to explore the feeling of not working together, the feeling of why you aren't, and how easy it ought to be. With another one, that idea of uh, an emotional trigger to a piece of content, we had a client called Procurian, now called Accenture, they got bought um, because of this piece of content, I'm sure. Um, and they were trying to address procurement managers and change the way they did things. We talked to a lot of procurement managers and we find that this absolutely strong theme kept coming out, which is nobody likes procurement managers. In the business, they're kind of isolated. Stakeholders don't like them. They resent when they show up and tell them how to buy things when they're the expert. And so we wanted to deal with that head on, really. Um, oh shit, am I out of order here? Oh no, there it is, good. Um, why everyone hates the procurement department and, and how to get the love we deserve. So rather than kind of realizing that this was a motivation and a feeling, it was deal with it head on. Go ahead and lance the boil. Go ahead and tell people, nobody likes us. The, the key thing here is the we and the us. So we weren't saying you, nobody likes you. Procurian considers themselves procurement people too, and so you know, we're all in the same boat. Uh, and basically the thing explores, why don't they like you? Because you can't bring value to the table. Why can't you bring value to the table? Because of these obstacles. Let's talk about these obstacles, that kind of thing. And again, an emotional appeal to the least emotional target audience you would expect in the world. But it really, really resonated, got a lot of press in the procurement press, and a lot of share and pass on, and just gave the company this kind of spin of being someone who got their target audience, that wasn't just pushing stuff at them. Again, with Salesforce, what does it feel like to give lousy customer service? We've done a lot of content. What does it look like to give great customer service? What does it look like to, to sell effectively? This is what does it feel like. I'm not going to be able to show it to you because we're running out of time, but what we did basically was start to explore, you know, what does it feel like to have to look at a customer and know that you're going to be letting them down? And we did something called, um, uh, I think I called it I Quit, but it got renamed online. Sorry, I'll have to think about this. Uh, out of service, I think it's called. And basically the whole slide share is told in post-it notes. And it's as if this, this customer service agent was working late one night, had enough, decided to quit, and left these for Dave, her boss. And one at a time with each page is a new post-it note. And it says, look, it's not worth it for me. I, I, I took the job because I want to help people. This sucks. You got to get your shit together. That kind of thing. And by the way, go read this book by uh, Salesforce that we just saw and you really should read kind of thing. Um, again, down into the feeling and it, it resonated quite a bit. We also did something weird in the borders. We, you know, the ego trapped concept for influencers is you drop their name in your content and they tweet it and stuff like that. We just scribbled some Twitter handles of some customer service influencers on the mat around the post-it notes. Didn't tell anybody about it, just leaked it to them, page 28, you're you're there. And an amazing thing happened. Not a single one picked it up. <laughs> Nobody gave a shit. <laughs> Doesn't always work. I thought I was sure this was going to work. OK. Go negative. So everyone thinks, oh, emotional has to be sentimental, has to be positive. I'm a big believer in hate. And a rant is one of the big things we do at Velocity for ourselves and for clients. A rant is saying, get out the hate and hate something. And it's key that you hate the right things. In this case, it's you hate the obstacles to your prospect's success. So you find out what's holding them back, and you hate on that, and you just pour scorn on it. Um, it's a really effective technique, but I think this Pollyanna positivism that marketers are taught somewhere makes everyone want to kill every negative. It's a huge missed opportunity. Our biggest home run, our biggest uh, big rock, was this deck, Crap, Why the Single Biggest Threat to Content Marketing is Content Marketing. And it's just kind of a rant and scream into the void about what happens when everybody's doing this, you know? When the differentiation and the advantage of content marketing goes away, um, what do you do? And again, this thing totally took off for us. I think it's at 850,000 views or something, which is five times more than anything else we've ever done. All because of hate, you know, and some good power of, of loathing. What's this one? Okay, this is the opposite of hate. I'm going to skip this one because I think we are running out of time. So I won't show you this one. This is the opposite of hate. It's a lovey-dovey one, which is nowhere near as fun anyway. Um, and don't fear sincerity. So this is a piece that, you know, I wrote this thing 
and then sat on it for a year because it felt like it was inappropriate in a way and too personal. And it's called The Search for Meaning in B2B. And it's on SlideShare now. And the idea there is how could I do B2B marketing for my whole life, you know? It's not glamorous. It's not meaningful. My friends are doing great charity things or doing amazing work in amazing places. And I'm here at the Supply Chain Management Conference in Scunthorpe. You know, what went wrong? <laughs> and in trying to answer that question, what, you know, why do I do it and why do I still love it? I just came up with reasons, you know, what is it that gives meaning to my work? And again, I got it out there. It was like opening a vein and it was all embarrassing even to me to read. So I sat on it for a year. Finally, it was because of the HubSpot guys and, and the Moz guys who have done that. They've just opened up and kind of showed that they're human beings. So I thought, what the hell, press publish, and kind of winced and sat back thinking, here comes the teasing. And the opposite happened. You know, People were really, really positive about it, really re responded well and said, I feel that shit too. So that was a lesson too. It's like, it's OK to go ahead and open a vein and be really, really honest about stuff. Um, so that's us. Uh, Go create some bloody good content. That's from the, uh, <laughs> the B2B side of uh, uh, Spinal Tap. Thank you very much.